Hello. Thank you all for joining us so much. Uh, my name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications at the Preservation League of New York State. And we are so thrilled today to be talking to Patrick Ciccone about the recently reissued book, Bricks and Brownstone, The New York Row House. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Preservation League, we are a statewide nonprofit focused on investing in the people and projects that champion historic preservation in terms of community revitalization, sustainable economic development, and preserving the places that are so important to all of us. Uh, we offer technical services, we do advocacy around historic preservation, we issue grants, and we do programs like this. And all of that is possible thanks to people like you who support us. If you're not yet a League supporter, we encourage you to join us. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Patrick. He is a league trustee. He's also a New York City-based preservationist who has led major rehabilitation projects in Manhattan, Brooklyn, upstate New York, and Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm going to let him get into his uh, presentation about the book, but I do want to say that if you have questions throughout the presentation, please drop them in the Q&A box, and I will come back at the end to get through as many as we possibly can. So with that, I will hand it over to Patrick. Take it away. Well, thanks, Katie. I'm, 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 I'm happy to present this. It feels a little disembodied since I'm speaking in my apartment and not in front of an audience. I'm going to have a slideshow that's going to be about 20 minutes, and then we'll go into, into questions. And as this is a slideshow, I'm going to try to keep this more, more colloquial than this would be a presentation, a lectern, but I'm going to start and end with, 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 with a couple slightly more formal remarks. So I'm going to go over to the slides, and we'll start, we'll start there. And I just want to confirm that this is this is up and visible, right? Hey, Katie. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Yep. Everyone can see it. See it then. Yep. Okay. So here we go. New York is a city of houses. This may not be obvious in a city now more famous for its skyscrapers and apartment buildings, not to mention its loft buildings and tenements. However, it's the row house or the brownstone, as you all know it that remains the essential building block for understanding New York's form. Even though many sections of, of the city, especially in Manhattan, have since been rebuilt, often many times over, these houses remain the markers of urbanity and scale against which newer buildings must be measured. So I'm gonna take you back in time, not the same block that you're, that you're gonna see on the next slide, but if you're imagining a complete cityscape, now moving backward in time, this is Prospect Lefferts Gardens in Brooklyn in the fall, and then the next slide is a complete row of houses, but on West 46th Street in, in Manhattan, photographed around 1900. And then moving e even further back in time, again, we're jumping around the city, but I want you to be able to, to, to picture any block being, being unzipped sort of in this fashion backward in time. And then up to West 133rd Street in Harlem, when you have the cityscape with the grid laid out, but you only have these, hand, these clusters of houses in, in threes, then in the background, you actually see a, a longer row. So if you can imagine these houses coming together in these small clusters, and then eventually coalesce, coalescing to, to form a cityscape uh, that you see in New York City today, that's how I want you to envision the role of row, the row house, both individually and as uh, markers of the city's urbanity. And then again, a similar view, but taking you a little higher to see the houses, houses under construction and the way they relate to the rest of the city. This is actually from the roof of the Dakota apartment house on West 72nd Street, Central Park West. The houses at the in the middle are actually uh, also designed by the same architect, Henry Hardenberg, and basically part of the same real estate development process. So I want you to focus on this 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 image because it 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 allows you to see what the row house at its most basic form really is. It's a means to develop city lots into, into single family houses. Now, how do we think about that further? Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the image on the screen, which is the 1811 gridiron plan of New York. It's a giant map, but uh, so if you're just viewing on a computer screen, you can see at the very left side of the screen, you have the cityscape as laid out and developed up to that time. And then north of that, 
where you see this sort of uh, going from darker gray into light, the grid laid out over the rest of Manhattan. This grid was really the determinant of construction in Manhattan, um, dividing the city into 25 100 foot building lots. I'm gonna read a quote that is, could be written today, but was actually written in 1878. New York is fast becoming a city of only the very rich and very poor. This was the American architect and building news in, in 1878, actually blaming these 25 by 100 foot lots for the city's economic disparity. Since that on these 25 by 100 foot lots, it was possible only to build single family houses, which row houses were originally, in quote, in which only the rich can afford to live, or on the same size parcel tenement houses, where the most of the city, or, or at least the most of Manhattan's population at that time, lived. So that's sort of a way of backing into the question of, of, of or into the subject of row houses, of, of why, they're, why they're here and developed in that form. I'm leaving a lot out, and I'm doing a truncated version of this so we can talk in a more colloquial fashion. So we're going to look at just a few basic questions about the row house form before getting into the book. First question is just, what is a row house? Uh, it seems like a simple question, and it kind of is. It's actually the, sort of the, more, the most basic urban form that makes sense for a single-family house in a dense, a dense urban setting. Row houses are obviously found throughout the, the world, most famously in London and northern European cities, as in Holland, and obviously in, in other North American cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, or D.C., or across New York State, even in Albany, Troy in Kingston. But in New York City, they are arguably take a, a, a more extreme form just because of the disparities of wealth and land pricing. Is that even, even by the 1830s, it was not the most sensible way to house a large number of people given the constraint of, of land values. So what's in the row house? You see that there's a pretty basic form in New York where you have a stoop uh, entrance, a parlor floor, and then above those bedroom, bedroom and servant floors, and then on the basement, we're gonna to go to a plan in a second, where you have a kitchen, kitchen dining room on those, on those uh, basement floors that are below street level. And these are houses on Charlton Street in, in just below Houston Street in the village from the 1830s. And then in this floor plan from the Historic American Building Survey, which is just this sort of beautiful, concise drawing of what the house was like, you could see and we can we could actually go back to this during the Q&A, the layout by floor. Keep in mind, this had bathrooms added to it, uh, but on the basement, there's a dining room at the front, a kitchen in the rear. On that front floor, floor up the stoop, a front parlor and a rear parlor. In this house, the stairs at the rear and some in the middle. And then on the upper floors, the bedroom, bedrooms, closet, and closets, and then again on the, this house, the second floor has been converted in, into a bathroom. Um, and this actually, the cross section gives you a really good idea of what's, what's inside of these houses and what, what they're like in, individually. But I think that we also need to consider them at number. Second question is who built these houses? In general, row houses in New York were designed by architect builders, not necessarily professional architects until the later 19th century, but architects that were, had specialty in construction and often were affiliated with developers on mini projects or sometimes were developers themselves. This is sort of the most succinct example um, of this that I, I, I found in my research is that this is actually in the collection of the New York Historical Society, a architect builder in Brooklyn named um, uh, Martins, uh, C.W. Martins. And actually he was recycling his old building uh, plans as molding profiles. Um, for, for, and this is actually from, a, I believe, a parlor in, in Pierpont Street. So these real estate speculators, speculators working with architect builders allowed houses to be built in great numbers. In Manhattan, this development went up through the spine of Manhattan Island, gradually filling up most of, this, most of the island up through today's Harlem over the 19th century. This is the view South and Fifth Avenue from 1857, as you can see the view looking southward toward the batter. Now in Manhattan, in contrast to Brooklyn, which we can, we can, we can talk a little bit about the Q&A, new fashionable, as in upper middle 
class or upper class neighborhoods kept being built in succession in uptown, sort of superseding old, old, old ones. So here you can sort of see that cycle in process as the then fashionable Union Square neighborhood is looking south toward the Bond Street area, which is in the mid-ground, toward the Battery, which were sort of these fashionable neighborhoods. So development throughout the 19th century was this process of successive development of new row house neighborhoods on outlying, in outlying districts, and then older houses would be subsumed and converted into boarding houses, apartments, or even to commercial buildings. So by the time you get to roughly the turn of the century, brownstones are in the apartment building comes into being. Brownstones themselves were seen as relatively obsolete and bygone relics of, of, of not a distant age, but something that had been superseded by elevator apartment buildings. And then in the case of, of houses, by houses that had individual fashion. Here you can actually see a brownstone on, um, on the upper east, today's Upper East Side, where it's flanked by Georgian townhouses. Now these Georgian townhouses are actually behind them, it's the same brownstone front. It's just they've been rebuilt in completely different styles and you've submerged this, this brownstone. So I wanted to give you um, a quote um, on the next one from this article from 1926 from the New York Times. As you can see, um, it might be cut off in the corner um, depending on your Zoom setup, but the brownstone age is coming to a close. So in this article, uh, the Times writer was sort of taking a, a view of Manhattan of seeing all these houses demolished in favor of apartment buildings. I'm going to quote it length because it's an interesting take on how old and obsolescent this seemed at the time. Quote, long blocks of these stolidly respectable houses are yielding to the record. Before long, the saunter who looks for the remains of old New York will have to cross twice to find a brownstone front. In almost every cross street of central Manhattan, from river to river, the dignity of brownstone gives way to shining new structures that rise higher. So I'm gonna take you from there really fast to where the book started with Charles Lockwood in the late 1960s. So brownstones themselves became, uh, they were subjects of urban renewal or just demolition in favor of new speculative construction. Poignantly, this block in Midtown uh, that still has the parlor floors intact in the late 1930s and then the famous quote from Edith Wharton, looking back at how, how negatively these were held by, by architects in a later era. She said that brownstone was the uniform hue that coated New York like a cold chocolate sauce. And then even, even at the same time as these houses were sort of held in disrepute, there was an appreciation of early row houses. Montgomery Schuyler, an early architecture critic in the late 19th century, found these same houses in Charlton Charlton Street and, pra and praised them. And then in the 40s, the first uh, major book, I mean, sorry, the first major research on them was a um, thesis about the New York Row House that was done at Columbia. And then in Ada Louise Huxtable's book, Classic New York from 1964, this appreciation of, of early federal and Greek revival survivors throughout the city. That sort of formed the basis for, for Charles's book in 1970, and again, in the, in, in, the, um, in the context of a time where uh, we can get back to the politics of this in the, in the Q&A, where 19th century architecture was seen as, as, as obsolete and actually targeted for destruction for urban, urban renewal. This from the early 1970s shows the row house as an endangered species. At the same time, in the late 1960s, uh, I think what today we would call um, gentrification was already occurring and people were buying buying um, houses in red line districts um, and 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 starting to res restore them even though again we have to I think we should we should not think of that think of this as a more continuous process than something that started one day this was the backdrop against which Charles uh, wrote research and wrote the original book he stayed with uh, many of these house owners, including uh, Evelyn and Everett Ordner in Park Slope in the late 1960s when he was a student at Princeton. There was no book about row houses at that time. So he set out to write one as a senior thesis. Uh, and then, it start, then he got a book contract to flesh out the book that was published in 1972. He also stood at this sort of 
amazing intersection of, 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 of Eris here in 1970 on West 11th Street when he and the photographer Robert Meyer were actually photographing group revival houses when 18th West 11th Street detonated. The weatherman had, to, had a bomb factory, a botched bomb factory in the basement of that house. They were there to photograph this. So that's the front page of the Times from the next day from March 7th, 1970. This was an epochal moment in Charles's, Charles's life that really brought the subject to reality. And again, we're looking at something that was 50 years ago today. The book, original book came out in 1972. And uh, one of the things we can get to into the Q&A is sort of what's different about both thinking about the subject and about the city in those 50 years. So the book, since it was published, has been regarded as, as a classic, the Brown, as the Brownstone Bible. The first edition's on the top left there, and then on an early 80s edition on the right, and the two editions from, from Rizzoli in, the 19, um, in 2003, two different covers. I think a lot of people on this, on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom call will, will be familiar with any or all of the editions. So part of the challenge of coming up with a new version of the book was what, what to cover, what to put in, what to leave out. So this is the cover of the new edition. What, um, what I did, and, and, and I can talk a little more about working with Charles and, and how I got to this project in, in, in the Q&A. Just want to get to the meat of what's covered in this, this new edition, subject-wise, is that the original book left out a lot of the post-1875 era, or treated it in a relatively cursory manner since Charles had run out of writing time. So one of the things, most important things was to cover this era of architecture and urban development in New York in a comprehensive manner. All, all these photographs are by the amazing photographer Dylan Chandler worked with on, 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 on shooting streetscapes. So we needed to get exteriors, and this you can see Romanesque and um, Romanesque um, and sort of Queen Anne slash Romanesque revival cityscapes in, 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 in Brooklyn there, as well as this Queen Anne house in Park Slope. Uh, a cityscape of, of, of more Renaissance revival houses in Upper Manhattan on the right. But as we were photographing all this new material, realized that we needed to comprehensively go back, not just to eras that weren't covered in detail in the original book, but needed to go back in time. And this is actually 1917, which is a neo neo Georgian neo federal house. We needed to go back and reshoot a lot of the a lot of the material and really give the book the visual rich, richness that the subject deserved. So in here that you can actually see Federal House on Charles Street uh, and, in, and in that interior of the same Charlton Street house, Greek Revival houses on Washington Square North and uh, the plaster work from the, from the Merchant's House, and then going into the more familiar Italian at Brownstone um, of the 1860s, which is sort of more the bread, bread and butter of, 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 of row house development in Brooklyn in that era. And then we also realized we needed to shoot a lot of interiors because we wanted to make, make it clear that, that these houses deserve to have a fate more than people, uh, rich owners destroying the insides and, and gutting them entirely. But wanted to pre present a diversity, diversity of interiors here. So in this house, uh, which is a Italian house in Prospect Heights, give this richness of, of discovery and entry in, into there, and of, of also being able to live in a house in a relatively modern way, um, as in this Greek Revival Italian hybrid from the 1850s, in the sort of more white, white wall, for lack of a better word, modern way of still dealing with historic interiors, too, too, too heavy, quote unquote, Victorian uh, on the left, or Otis Pratt Pearsall's parlor on the right, which is fairly similar, um, barring the, the, the light fixtures, to what it might have looked like back in the 1830s. Um, so just want to close on a few notes and then open it, open it up for discussion. Um, first of all, you have here Washington Square North, which would be familiar to all of us. And just wanted to think why we appreciate row houses for what they are today, even though they were built for such a different time. So though they are constructed as single family homes, 
New York's row houses have for over two centuries proven suitable to many future lives. Rather than enforcing uniformity, a complaint that was long levied at brownstones, row houses tend to instead create a dense but not overwhelming streetscape and one through the many interests of the size of the buildings themselves promote a lively variety and human scale that no other form of New York building has since matched. Today, as New York continues to be rebuilt in even taller and more crystalline form, the skyline and streets of boom areas suffer from a placelessness, which has perhaps less to do with the architectural quality of the buildings themselves than their disconnect from the city from which they spring. New York has, has been and always will be ever-changing dynamic, but this historic cityscape must continue to undergird the spiritual as well as the real city. And on a more colloquial note, want to think about that in the context, not just the buildings, but of obviously it's hard to, to talk just about the houses as they were constructed, but as they've been lived in in, in many future, future lives and forms. And I, 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 I think I was thinking about this, watching Do the Right Thing and bringing this back to some more contemporary discussion of issues, is that this, beyond this, the subjects that are treated in, 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 in in, in the movie, um, Spike Lee's 1989 Do Like Right Thing. Actually, row houses themselves are sort of part of the subject and part of the way that people live and experience the city for good or for worse. And keeping in mind that in preservation, we're actually dealing, dealing with buildings and with cities and with things that were built, built for other eras and for other times. And we've sort of inherited, inherited them in some way, again, for good or, good or for worse of how we, how we treat them in the present. And I sort of leave that up for an open point of discussion because I think it is one of the most challenging things about even thinking about um, the row house and the brownstone is that they were built for the most part for upper middle class, or even upper class um, uh, citizens, of the, uh, residents of the city and were relatively exclusive at the same time over 200 years. They've had, had other lives, both up, ups and downs, uh, socioeconomically and, and 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 just in terms of use. So I would like to just be able to think about the row house as more than just how they started out. Though the subject of the book is is by limitations of space more about when they were originally constructed and built, rather than that future that life after their original construction. So with that, I again like to thank everyone at the at the Preservation League for setting this up and open it up for a discussion. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, if you want to take your screen share down. Yeah, screen share. Okay. <laughs> um, that was great. We had one question come in already, so I'll start with that um, and then we can get into a conversation. But what is the difference between a row house and a townhouse? So I think it's, 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 it's sort of one of, um, pretension perhaps is that a, a, a townhouse I would say that in a there's there's two answers one is in the specifically in New York context is that I think that you saw that picture of of the row house subsumed by the townhouses around I think townhouse in a New York City context is an architect individual architect designing a single house for a single owner um, which is actually pretty pretty rare at least when they were originally constructed it's you know somewhat more common I think in London if you look at it comparatively. At the same time, both cities really are speculatively built for uh, where the houses are more or less all the same. So that's the sort of the way I I like. I think it still makes sense to divide it, and I think that that again this is sort of a familiar thing from um, um, to this audience. But I think that a lot of preservation is dealing with average buildings, not average that they're good or bad but that, that there are a lot of good average buildings and that's what makes the city great. It's not a being a, a collection of great, a few great buildings and a lot of duds. And I, I say that that's sort of the distinction I make. Uh, obviously you also have brownstone, the material became the name for all their pro houses. So in New York you have the specific issue of, of that all, all row houses, are not brownstones, but all brownstones are row houses, but really it's okay to call them brownstones. No one's gonna care. There's a lot of semantics. I, I, I don't care. <laughs> um, we have a few more questions that came through. Uh, so 
Have many houses been lost between Lockwood's original publication and the new edition? You know, I, I would say that the answer is, is, is a mixed bag then. I'd say that there's fewer, few, fewer houses have been destroyed outright. I think people continue to alt, alter houses for, you know, for better or for worse in, in, in significant, in, in the varying degrees of, 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 of good or bad there. I'd say that the two greatest lot losses since then, since the book was written, one of them I actually think is just, it's not that many houses, but again, this is speaking more to the, to the life of the buildings, not as, a, as residential buildings, but in their future life, is that there used to be more uh, row house survivors, high-end row house survivors in Midtown in the 50s, uh, 40s and 50s, that gave a variety to the side streets. Now, you know, obviously most of New York is, especially in Midtown, is, is the third, second or third or fourth generation of building on that site. So you're not going to save them all. But I think they're something that the, the, the houses provided, even when they're converted in commercial, is this mid-block variety. Ada Louise Huxtable writes about that. A lot of that's gone because they actually have, uh, the city's allowed tall buildings on side streets for better or worse. I think that that's actually one of the major losses, but I don't, I, I don't think that preservation is well equipped to deal with preserving those sort of houses anyway. I think that 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 I, the, the other major loss is, again, something which, by regulation, have a complete inability to, to regulate is interiors, where um, a lot of wealthy owners, or extremely wealthy owners, have actually, that would have never considered a house 10 or 20 years ago, now with advances in, in security technology and stuff like that, actually want to buy houses, but want to excavate them to two or three stories below, build a panic room and a pool, and really obliterate the interior, which, again, there's no, it's something more that I, uh, I hope putting the book out to convince people that you don't have to do this, or you don't have to live in a house from the 1820s to, 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 to do this. There's, there's, there, there's, there's another place to live for that. That's a skyscraper on West 57th Street. <laughs> So I would say that those are the bigger losses. It's it's less less you know neighborhoods and and, and and individual houses. Got it. So there's no neighborhood in particular where brownstones are more in danger than than others. I I'm I'm trying I'm, I mean I'm trying to, to be general. I'm going to think I'm going to think of, I might have another answer by the end of that. But I think <laughs> that it's actually one of the things where since since row house neighborhoods in general have so many different property owners, mm -hmm. it's without whole scale urban renewal, it's actually kind of harder to obliterate larger numbers of it because you just have to assemble, assemble houses. So I think that, you know, these sort of the things I discussed are more of the threats. Got it. Uh, we had another question come through specifically about Colonnade Row. How would you classify it, and have you ever been inside any of them? And if so, are the apartments generally intact? You know, I've never, I've unfortunately never been inside in Colonnade Row. For those of you who, 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 who don't know it, it's the Alexander, Alexander Jackson Davis design um, row on, um, on Lafayette. Lafayette Street, what well, was Lafayette Place, which was dead end. They're sort of, they're definitely Greek revival houses. They're almost... They're, they're hard to classify since they don't look like that much else of New York row houses with these freestanding, uh, not sorry, not with freestanding, with these giant columns on the front sort of, that sort of mask the, 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 the front elevation of the house. I think that they're, they're, the future of those is so hard to know because half of, half of it doesn't exist anymore and the material is in such bad shape that I don't know what the path beyond the continued stabilization in the screens is. So there are almost buildings that are preserved and should be preserved, but in, in some ways are half lost. We actually didn't include any contemporary photographs of them in the book just because it was impossible to even get a, a sense of, 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 what, of what they were. They do, if you look up the historical photos of them, give an idea of another vision for New York City urbanism in which instead of um, coming together in a piecemeal fashion, as you saw at the beginning of 
developers doing a handful of rows, that every single row was architect designed a monumental block block front and it was sort of this architectural work. So there are in, in many ways a path, a path not taken. And one of the, the, the parentheticals there is one of the sort of the fascinating things about when architects get more involved with row house design and construction is actually in, is in an era where everyone wants them to look distinct. So that some of the blocks on the Upper West Side or in Park Slope are actually designed by the same architect, but they're all designed to look different. So it was just a different, once architects were, professional architects had more of a hand design, there was at least for a time being in the 1870s, 1880s of making everything look, look different. Got it. And can you talk a little bit about the development of the different styles of the row houses and how that kind of changed over time? Well, I think, I think that, that one of the big things that was, I want to put this in the context of, of work on the book, is that the, work, the book itself was kind of like a historic preservation project, is that you have this existing classic to put into new form. The way that Charles wrote the book originally was actually viewing these as a succession of, of, of styles. Um, and once you got into a certain point, it didn't kind of, one, it didn't really make sense because you were reached a certain point where you can't classify things. Um, and I think that, that in, in some ways you have to approach this in an even simpler manner, is that the basic form of these houses didn't actually change that much. There was, there was technology, they got bigger, but through the whole 19th century, the house plan was, you know, again, this is a vast, a vast simplification, but they weren't that different. And like all New York City buildings, it's a box with a front on it. So that the styles, you know, without thinking what the insides look like, are just sort of, of, of succeeding eras of fashionability, putting its face on that. That's not in a pejorative way, because this actually is what forms what's so wonderful about New York in the first place, uh, is just this sort of feeling of this, this, these varying stage sets that the buildings create on the street. And which I don't do the screen grab from there, but not to not to not to, to keep going back to Spike Lee. But if you're familiar with Do the Right Thing, in the beginning of the movie actually has the street that the movie takes place on as a projection and a stage stage set. And I think that you can kind of think of, of building style sometime in that way is that you have this very limited space to make the building say and mean something, especially when the other two sides of it are are, are shared walls and no one looks at the back unless you have that garden. But together, they form some something something else. Yeah, um, and you had mentioned uh, during the presentation about row houses um, further upstate in places like Albany and Kingston. Are there great differences in how that form evolved as it spread to other places, or are they kind of part and parcel of the same same thing? That was well, going I'm gonna on this. I'm gonna admit that my 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 knowledge of it is only based on, on visits, not on, 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 on deep research. I think that, that they are actually fairly, fairly similar in design. I think it's, again, it's a question of scale in numbers. Is that New York City was, was land prices and density were so high that houses took this bigger and more extreme form. And then in, 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 Cities upstate, I think that once you got streetcar networks and other forms of transportation, is that is that it non-row housing became viable in a way that it didn't in New York. So that the row houses are more concentrated in 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 truly urban areas and not spread in this vast plain of uh, you know like Brooklyn. They go on for miles and miles and miles. But again, this is a difference in the scale and scope of the cities. I think that one of the, the, the things that would be worth be looking into on a comparative basis is just is looking at this because I, I don't know if, if the research has been done. The thing that is, is fascinating too is from the super early era of just tiny places that have, have row houses that are just surprising, like Rensselaerville, New York is a tiny hamlet, but it's next to a grain mill and there's a main street with, 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 with early, early 19th century, maybe even late 18th century row houses, even though it was a walking, a walking main street. So that's a little bit of a cop out of an answer, but I think it's a subject for further research. And again, to tie this back to, 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 to another movie is that Age of Innocence 
they filmed it in Troy because it was actually easier for Troy to be a stand-in for for the New York City of that era than it was for um, to use some of, of, of New York. Though, if, if you don't watch the movie that closely or stuff will still throw you off historically. So again, a subject for further research and maybe this is a, 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 a you know a future comparative pop. Yeah, maybe a road trip to upstate for you. And, and actually the other thing, very briefly, is that just that I think that that's what makes New York has actually made them easier to adapt than uh, for apartments in other future later uses than other cities is if you go to Baltimore or Philadelphia, they're all row house cities, but the row houses are actually very, very small. In some ways you would think that that'd be easier. They're more affordable, but New York has had such a housing crisis for, for two centuries that the need to create new housing out of everything is a constant. So it's actually, it's, it's taking a four to 6,000 square foot house and dividing it into single room occupancy or apartments is a lot easier. And there's always been the demand for that where you go to Philadelphia or Baltimore, there's obviously a lot of other historical, sociological, economic reasons for all of this, but it just seems that, that smaller houses, at least in an American context, a Northeast context are harder, potentially harder to adapt. Yeah. Um, and someone had asked, uh, I know townhouses were converted to flats over the years, but was the row house form used for multiple dwellings? So I guess building row houses specifically to be um, multifamily apartments. Well, this is a, a, a super interesting question because it's sort of one of these things that came up in the book of when does this end? When does when do we stop saying that these are, are, are row houses? Because if you look at all of New York City, there's actually arguably more attached single family houses or apparently single family houses built after after World War One than before, even though what we sort of consider this form is, is from earlier. Um, because land prices were so expensive, is that in in even in Brooklyn, is that you find a lot more houses that were built as two family houses, but to give the appearance of of a still a single family brownstone. So in, in Prospect Lefferts Gardens, you know, Ninth Street and Park Slope, and then much, much continuing further out, you have higher stoops, and they always designed to have rental apartments beneath that. And then in these neighborhoods, too, that didn't necessarily, in the original construction, support very tall buildings. You have buildings that look, look like single-family houses, but you can tell from the floor heights that were actually built as, as, as four apartments originally. So there is some of that design, but it was one of these things where, where there, there, there's, there's a, a book called Form Follows Fiasco by Peter Blake, which is, he's a modernist architect writing about the failures of modernism. One of the fascinating observations he makes is that, is that flexible buildings, buildings designed to be flexible prove to be inflexible, and that buildings design, purpose-built buildings actually end up weirdly being flexible. Um, this is obviously not always the case, but that row houses in a weird way have, have, have proven that just having a set of stairs and a medium level of density has proved suited to adaptation in various forms just because they're relatively simple things in the end. And again, create enough density to support urban, urban, urban life, meaning transportation and commercial districts without being overwhelming or overwhelmingly expensive to, to rehabilitate and change. Got it. Okay. Um, another question was, do the owners of brownstones own the land beneath them or just the houses? I think in general, in New York, there are very few ground lease um, examples with houses. That's not to say there aren't any. There are, I mean, this is definitely with, with skyscrapers and some co-ops with these ground lease structures uh, or ground lease uh, mechanisms. In general, it's, 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 it's free and clear. This is actually, I, I don't know that much about the architecture and urbanism in, in London, but this is that, that a, a lot of London developments, the land was never conveyed, is my understanding. So the ownership is a, is a much stranger, stranger issue. But it's, um, it's actually an interesting comparative urbanism is that in, in London, again, this is a broad sweep, but a, that whole estates were divided and developed at the same time 
where you have these tiny little parks. In, in New York, you actually had speculation in building lots and the assemblages were always smaller. And then the, the determinant of the design was the street, of the ultimate urban form was the street grid. So it's sort of, you could definitely see that if, you, if you've been and think of the two cities uh, comparatively. Are there any tours that you can recommend that show some of the best preserved row houses in the city and any that show the interiors specifically? Well, the, the, the interiors, there's, there's many of the neighborhood organizations have, have, have house tours. Uh, the, and the best one um, is the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation does an annual ha um, house tour with about six houses. This one, I believe, is going to be in the fall. It's been rescheduled because of, of, of COVID. MAS does a lot of good walking tours neighborhood to neighborhood. Though I would say that, that one of the things that of, of the book, the book doesn't have walking tours in it. There's just no space. Also, it's so heavy, you would not be wanting to carry the book around with you. Uh, which is one reason we didn't do it, is that uh, I hope if you get a chance to read or see, see the book is that it sort of teaches you how to, to see buildings in a, in a way enough that you can almost self-guide. Not that you don't need a guide. The AIA, AIA guide is great. But I think that one of the, 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 the things about the houses is that there's so many of them that in, in New York, if you're you know, walking or even better biking around Brooklyn or Manhattan, even parts of the South Bronx, in a very limited number of places in Long Island City, there's so many houses that I think that that it's it, there's a lot of discovery to be had, and just I I would say that the the just the historic district maps are pretty good too of, of where to initially to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, and are there a lot of row houses in Queens as well, or not so much in that neighborhood? Someone had asked about that. Well, so this is this is one of these 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 classification things is that there are a lot of of attached houses in in Queens. I think to me, and this was a, a challenge of where to wrap this up, is that they're ultimately a little bit of a different tradition. They look different, they're attached houses. A lot of them have garages, not all of them. They're from a little later. But one of the tidy um, uh, elements of architectural history that had in the book was that, that at, in 1917, when the US ended the war, the building trades in, the U, in New York came to a halt. After that, um, for upper middle class housing, apartment buildings really became the dominant form. And in, in fancy, wealthy neighborhoods replaced row houses on the Upper West Side or on the Upper East Side. So I think that these later, more modest, again, more prolific forms of, of, of row housing almost came out of a different tradition and in the end were built, built and developed and designed by um, uh, different, different parties. So I think that the tradition Tradition does, in some ways, stop in 1917, but it's not to say that there aren't plenty of houses and row housing in, in Queens. It's just, it's different. And I'm not sure if anyone has really written or analyzed it. It's just, it's just the, it's one of these things, once you get to the scale, too, it's, it's, it's almost a different question of, of multitudes. Yeah. Well, maybe your next book. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have another question. Uh, I've been finding row houses in Manhattan and Brooklyn that use terracotta for ornament. Have you found examples of these? Well, again, this is, 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 is going to be tied to when, when they were con constructed. I think I, I think I did see Susan Tunick somewhere on the, on the chat question. Was this a question from Susan? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, think, I think in general it's, it's, it's going to be tied to just when, when they were constructed and when that was overall popular for, for building ornament. I would say that Susan's much more of an expert than I am on, on, on this subject. And I don't know how, how it came to preference of using terracotta over cast stone or, 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 or other, other decorative elements there. And uh, we have a question about the brownstone specifically. Where did it come from and how durable is the stone for building fabric? And I guess also, um, are there environmental worries for wearing that brownstone down in terms of preservation? So, so the brownstone came from, from in general, there were a quarry in Middletown, Connecticut, and then another quarry in, in New Jersey that I believe supplied most of it. And this was easy to buy water transport. The yards were on the, um, on the, on the riverfront, and it was, it was cut there. If cut correctly, like Trinity Church, it doesn't weather. It's, but most of it is 
is, is cut incorrectly with the grain and actually spalls and weathers really badly. Uh, there's the famous quote by Richard Nickel, great architecture has two natural enemies, water and stupid men. In this case, stupid men cut it wrong and water, water freezes on the exterior and spalls it, spalls it out. So a lot of, there's very few brownstone front houses that survive that haven't been altered in some way to, to res, you know, restore, for lack of a better word, uh, what's there. And I think this is actually what you'll see in, um, hopefully there are no residents of Carroll Gardens that are going to come in pitchforks when I say this, but even though it's a historic district, it's actually fairly, fairly mutilated because it was the, the detail was lost and sort of put back in a, a very, very um, uh, rough or non-existent form. Um, so I think that actually you'll see that masonry, um, that brick fronted houses often survive more intact than the brownstone front ones. Um, and going back to the Wharton, Wharton um, quote is that brownstone, brownstone front becomes this whole metaphor in the mid 19th century for cheap, cheap shoddy fortunes because a lot of the people building the freely fancy now lost brownstone mansions on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan also got rich through uh, in during the Civil War with shoddy material and it's sort of it actually becomes this whole sociological thing of a shoddy building material, shoddy fortunes and I think is one of the reasons it becomes, uh, falls into, into dis, um, disrepute. Got it. Okay. And so all of the different facade styles that, that end up happening, does the book define those? Um, yeah, I think that, that one of the things, again, the challenge of this is, is getting to something in the, in the 1880s where there's so many different styles. It's, it's hard to classify this stuff, um, period. And especially going back to, as we said before, is that New York City architecture, until you get to tall enough buildings that have four sides, is a box with one elevation. And there's not, you can do something, but you often can't do that much just on one elevation. So that, that the classification of, of any one of these things as Queen Anne, Romanesque Revival, et cetera, a lot of them blend together in, 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 in the same way. So I wanted to sort of point out that, that by the time that this was occurring, that architects were thinking differently about cities anyway, and that eclecticism itself was its own, own style. And some of the need to classify these things comes, comes afterwards to actually sort of sort them out and, and, and identify them. One of the things that we were worried about happening, um, I worked um, uh, the, with credit on the book, Jonathan Taylor, who's a, a preservationist uh, as well, as we're doing some of the research, was that, that we'd go back and find that, that what people called stuff in the 1960s, 1970s, was gonna be completely different from what people called it when it was built and we'd come up with uh, an issue. It didn't really sort out that way, but it is still, if you go to back to something like Queen Anne, it's like, well, where did this come from? And everyone's talking about the time, sort of like, well, this is a name for no, a style that doesn't exist and it's not classifiable in the first place. So I don't know if that's a, a, a prevaricating non-answer, but that's sort of as, as architecturally diverse as New York City Warehouse, is that you have, all of 19th century architecture in there. And there's a lot of things that span, you know, 1789 to 1917 to use a long 19th century, but just, you know, in the, in the 1870s, 1880s, there's just, there's just, there's just, you could just keep going on and on about those, 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 those decades. Yeah. Um, we have a comment um, that's leading me into a question, but I'll read it for you. Um, I think people are destroying brownstones left and right in certain neighborhoods, such as Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights. Mansions like 669 are being ignored by LPC and will be demolished at the end of the month. I do wish there was a greater push to preserve. So from that, I'm wondering, do you know of any campaigns out there that are working specifically to preserve um, brownstones and row houses anywhere in the city? Patrick do and politically is allowed to do I think that that there's been a lot of for lack of a better word micro historic districts of a handful 
of houses of you know that's just just that that they're fine but i think that a lot you know for neighborhoods the larger sweep often often makes sense because where you have large collections of houses this is sort of the urbanism that to me is is more important to preserve that being said that there's been great efforts um to get you know expand crown heights district as well as the ones in bedford stuyvesant to 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 include a, a lot of a lot of houses so um i th i think that part of it is just the political will of what people are willing to do at, at landmarks so just and uh, citywide i think that 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 not to go way on a political tangent but preservation hasn't been uh at the forefront of 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 this this administration's um priorities sure to pile on the mayor like everyone else <laughs> Um, and we had another comment that said, it's worth noting that the greatest, tre greatest threat to row houses and townhouses in New York City is not demolition, but current um, upzoning and the lack of landmarks protections that allow for unsightly rooftop additions. More often than not, these vertical extensions break the roof line and have no architectural quality. So is that something that you ran into as you were um, documenting and kind of going back and, and photographing and, and doing more research for, for your book? Yeah, I think I think that that it's it's one of these things too. Is that is that the like the in in neighborhoods where the houses are less intact, there might be a sensible way to do it, but that there's there's no often that it's just done in such a gruesome and disfiguring way that it makes you doubt that there is ever a reason to do it at all. I know that that, that there's a lot of me worse examples of this in in Washington D.C. where you're basically landing landing you know a UFO on on, on top of these houses. I think again, it gets into a broader question of where you add where you add units and where the zoning zoning ends up, which is sort of a, a different question. Maybe it's it's tied to, but it, you know, a slightly different question than just the preservation of the, of the houses themselves, of feeding that density to avenues and you know encouraging assemblages rather than just these 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 the, the, the you know putting a box on top. And we had a question um, about the buildings on St. Mark's Place. Um, is it likely to presume the interiors of the landmarked federal building on St. Mark's Place where Alexander Hamilton's widow lived in the 1830s are largely broken up, including moldings and fireplaces? Do you have the address on, on that one? Is that part of the Stuyvesant Square? Um, it does not say in the question, okay. but um, I think that in general- plant, If you have uh, specifics on that, you can drop that in the Q&A. Yeah, I think in general, is the preservation of interiors is, 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 is a really challenging question because um, by law, by the way U.S. land use works, is that you have to be traditionally publicly accessible to be a landmarked interior in the first place. So almost no private house meets that cri criterion whatsoever. So as long as it's privately owned, there's very little that can be, that can be done. I think that this again is one of the goals of the book is to to have people that have the resources to put into changing a house that think about it in a different way and just don't don't destroy. Um, you know, other countries have different schemes, but we're just it's just the way that that the way our law works. There's not really a way short of having the pub, you know, a public agency. So we have four St. Mark's Place. Um, I have to look up the, the house on the map to get the exterior. But again, the interior is just, it's such a complicated question. Yeah. Um, another question, was there a fairly sudden transition from brownstone to limestone and other light facades, or do you see it as being a more gradual change? So, so one of the, one of the, the ways I was thinking of, of, uh, of breaking up the chapters differently, which I wasn't going to do, but was just to do it between various 19th century art, uh, financial panics. Because before we had uh, the Federal Reserve System and other things to buoy the economy, we didn't just have recessions or depressions, we had full-scale panics where everything stopped. So it's actually kind of sometimes easy to, 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 to periodize things just by calamity. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the case after the Civil War where Panic of 1873 more or less, that's the end of, of brownstone front houses, at least in, in, in Manhattan. There's still some built in, there's in, in Brooklyn. 
And then in the same way is that all this stuff that we see in, um, uh, in the eclectic era of the late 19th century is that in the, uh, the panic of 1893 really wipes that away. And that people like to periodize stuff with the World's Columbian Exposition and all this other stuff of the Beaux-Arts, but it's also just that there's no building for a few years. And then once stuff starts, it's like, well, let's make stuff look different. So that's sort of, you know, in some ways is the easier, easier guide to it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's, that's sort of, um, and not to sound completely cynical about this, is that, is that New, York, New York's urbanism, a lot of what we love about it was created for completely avaricious reasons that we would not think were charitable or even you know, well-suited to ur urbanism at all. We're dealing with a legacy of, of people building these houses for profit on boom and bust cycles. It happens to have given us stuff that we, we love and want to inhabit and preserve today. But that was sort of the reason the stuff was, was, was built, was to, for people to make money. And so you can find this, you can actually, it's an easy way to periodize the houses just based on those boom and bust cycles. Sure. Um, and so how did you end up working on this book? How did how'd that come to be? And do you have any other books? Yeah, so that, that's, I, I left that out just because it's, it's, it's a longer story. But um, so I was a, a student at, at the Columbia's uh, GSAP in the preservation program. 2006, fall 2006 started there. Um, Charles had been actually living in California for almost three decades, had employed some students as research assistants, and actually he was needing someone that, that for, uh, for actually more general interest writing that he was, he was doing. I had, I had worked at a reference publication and stuff like that. So I, I emailed him, and then we just realized we were like, we had a good working relationship and had good research skills. So he always wanted to expand the book. So we started some work on that, I think 2007. Uh, in, this was not long after the previous Rizzoli edition. And then after the, the 2008, as I'm, I'm, I'm timing stuff to recessions, I guess as well. 2008 crash is that he sort of tabled that. And then a couple years later, worked with him on a book with his bro Charles's brother, John Locke, who was a park ranger in DC, which is about the first two weeks of the Civil War in Washington. And then Charles had cancer, and then, but still wanted the book to, to, you know, to, to live on in some form. So he died in 2012, and then his uh, the estate wanted the book to continue. So basically, for lack of a better word, gave me carte blanche to do, do what I wanted. Respectfully, you know, putting that trust, which was huge, because the book is a classic and didn't want to alter, alter it in a way that would be disrespectful of it, but also didn't want to just put it out again with my name on it and not change it. So the idea of, you know, this is another reason this book took another seven years from there was to really, to, to make something that would last another 50 years. It's rare that a book matters, that people care about it for that long in the first place. So wanted something that people, one that people that knew the original book would, would, would want this version and not just view it as, a reprint, but also something that, that would stand the test of time. And like I said, too, um, is sort of like a historic preservation project because I, I work with Charles on his lot, but I think that actually the shape of the book was something that was, it was a collaboration, but a different sort of collaboration because you're collaborating with someone who's no longer there. You sort of have to, to realize in the end that you, you, were, you might do something that, that they wouldn't originally want to do, not for bad reasons, but Charles was so young when this book came out, um, and it was so tied up in his life and his and his, his 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 identity that it was something that he had a personal relationship with, which I didn't have that to the original. So I think it allowed a slight amount of distance to the subject and to sort of go beyond that. And the nice thing about it is that the original book is still you can still buy used copies of it, so you can have all of them all yeah. of them together at once. Again, the challenge here is what to leave out. The subject's so big, there's just, and this is sort of um, one of the things that makes it, it, the synthetic process of actually writing something that's, history book is sort of leaving everything on the cutting room floor. It's like, you know, 90, you know, 99% of what you know doesn't end up in there. And actually for people to read, read the text, read the captions, look at the images, it's to give them the tools to look at this stuff in a way that they can sort of put the story together themselves. And I think that this is actually sometimes a, a 
I don't know, a fault of preservation is, is, is that is to be exhaustive, but you can be exhaustive and know the stuff without presenting it to everyone else. And I'd say, I say this as someone who loves um, going through the book, the very early historic district reports for Greenwich Village and Park Slope, all these models of, 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 of concision and kind of making your judgment, telling you about it and moving on. It's not, it's not describing the thing, you know, in all, you know, a page on one, on one building. It's a few sentences that you get out of the way. And sort of, I think that that's, it's, it's sort of a more valid way of experiencing uh, the city and the way you do it every day. Sure, hitting the high points. Well, it's a beautiful book. Hopefully people get a chance to grab a copy. Uh, we are just at time. So uh, to anyone who had questions that we didn't get to, I do apologize. Um, you can email us and we can try to get those to you. Um, but otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. Patrick, thank you so much for spending time to talk about the book. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, if anything comes up, uh, just reach out to the league and we would love to hear from all of you. And encourage everyone to support the league, which is critical in preservation efforts, obviously not just in New York City, but across New York State, and is really part of, of uh, especially upstate, is, is, is part of, of a critical part of keeping all these historic communities intact and, 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 and thriving. So I encourage you to support, support the league, and I think you might be getting a, a follow-up email on that. So please do that. You'll all be hearing from us. Our website is preservenys.org. You can find us and all the great things that we are working on. And hopefully we'll see you um, in another webinar sometime soon. So okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.